I'm sick of crying at the moment. <laughs> it's, yeah, every time we open another door, it's just gutting. We'll just clean up and, and rebuild and, and start over again. This is a familiar story for tens of thousands of residents across southern Queensland and northern New South Wales in the aftermath of ex-tropical cyclone Alfred. Experts reckon it will cost billions of dollars to repair and rebuild. Basically the living room is destroyed, both the side walls, the roof has come down. It's not the first time homes here have been affected by natural disasters. And it most likely won't be the last, as climate change brings more common and severe floods, fires and cyclones. But it's also got people talking about how these homes can be rebuilt to minimise future damage and improve safety. In Australia, new houses have to be built to meet strict rules, laid out in the National Construction Code, or NCC. It sets minimum requirements for things like structural safety, fire protection, health and amenity, and energy efficiency. Those requirements change slightly depending on where you are. Each state and territory has its own building regulation. So we have this overarching, let's say, um, umbrella of the National Construction Codes that then gets um, filtered down at state level. Yep, the NCC can be modified by individual states and territories to suit their needs. For example, New South Wales has stricter rules around sustainable building materials, and houses in Queensland are designed for much warmer conditions than houses in Victoria. But there are times when the rules get changed for everyone. The most radical change to the National Construction Code came in the wake of Cyclone Tracy, which devastated Darwin on Christmas Eve of 1974. I kept making stupid statements like, oh, she said, is it, is it going to be safe? And I said, oh, in here we're safe as houses. While all the time I could see through the crack in the door, the house was disintegrating. The Category 4 storm battered homes with wind speeds of 217 k's an hour flattening about 80% of the entire city and killing more than 60 people. It's clear that the prevalent method of construction was not suitable for people, uh, for Australians, living in uh, a cyclone belt. This disaster prompted the establishment of the life standard meaning that from the 1980s onwards, houses across the country were built to ensure that residents could survive whatever natural disaster may occur. Since then, we've seen newer houses stand up to the punishment much better, and building rules continue to evolve as technologies and materials improve and the climate changes. But experts like Francesca reckon it's not just the rules around how new houses are built, but the rules around where they're built. That one's not easy. Information on disaster risk areas isn't always easy to get, and some new developments are going up in areas that have previously flooded. That's a concern some have about the government's plan to build 1.2 million new affordable homes by 2029, with location being a key part of affordability. We sat down with planners, but also people that work in state government and people that are working in disaster risk management, so people that are on the front line of all of this to understand what the concerns are. And the concerns are that sometimes because the complexity of the governance systems where there's so much going on, we lose bits of information along the way for which our final decision might not be the best one. Emergency services and insurers hold lots of risk information, but access to it can be tricky due to privacy and commercial sensitivities. And it's not just a problem for the government building agencies. A recent report from Domain Group found that only 29% of home buyers know about the disaster risks facing the homes they live in, which experts reckon could massively change with a little more accessibility to information. There are some areas in urban context in cities that we don't really think around those issues. Um, we're not so aware and some people only get to know a bit too late. Sometimes all the information is available though. And some argue that to build enough affordable housing, developing in areas with some risk is necessary. 
That's happened in Townsville, where the state government sold land for new housing in the town's high-risk flood area, with the aim of providing houses that were 50% cheaper than the town's average. For established communities in areas we know have become more of a risk, this idea isn't about driving people away from them. Instead, experts reckon it's about encouraging residents to retrofit their homes with new designs and materials to make them more resilient. Meaning that when a disaster has passed, they still have a home to live in. While that can be an expensive exercise, many insurance and housing experts say it'll make things less expensive in the long run for everyone, as the cleanup and rebuild costs after disasters will cost the government, insurers and taxpayers much less.